Turn your Bibles, if you would, to Psalm 67 as we continue our study through the Psalms this summer. If you're using one of the Blue Chair Bibles, it's on page 481. As we look at this and explore some of the themes of this psalm, I sort of want to take you through a large section of your Bible. It's a shorter psalm, so I can do a little little longer at the front. (laughs) To understand this psalm, we really have to go to Genesis chapter 12. Now, if you are really good at Bible trivia, you'll remember that Genesis chapter 12 is one of the large turning points in the Bible Because it is the first time that God calls out to Abram, later Abraham. Let me read you from Genesis chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And it's that last phrase that I want to focus on this morning. In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Even though this is the beginning of God's chosen people, Israel, embedded into that beginning of that singular nation, is a promise to all the nations of the world. But why was this needed? Well, for that, we need to go one chapter backwards. And it's a story you'll remember, but you probably didn't remember it was right before the Abraham story. And that is the Tower of Babel. There's a great juxtaposition in these first chapters of Genesis between the Tower of Babel and Abraham, and I'll point that out in a second. But just to remind you of the story, again, I'm going to read a larger section here. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bimutin for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, behold, they are one people and they have all one language. And this is the only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their speech so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel because there the Lord had confused the languages of all the earth and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. This contrast between the Tower of Babel story and Abraham, what did the people say? Let us make a name for ourselves. And what was God's promise? That he would make Abraham's name great. But for our purposes today, we should see the creation of all the languages and subsequent separate nations as a judgment on the nations with a promise for salvation and blessing for the nations through Abraham. So early in our Bibles, we have this future promise of the salvation and blessings of the nations. And there are many stops along the way in this theme that runs throughout your Bible, including our text today, but let me highlight a few a few highlights. First, we see at the beginning of Matthew, Jesus is called the son of Abraham, right? Calling back to, he is the one through whom this blessing 
to all the nations will come. And in Matthew chapter 12, itself a fulfillment of what was spoken by Isaiah, Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there, and many followed him, and he healed them all and ordered them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles or to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench until he brings justice to victory, and in his name the Gentiles, the nations, will hope. Even Jesus in his understanding of his mission was not limited to the Jewish people. So it shouldn't surprise his disciples when he gives one of his last commandments. What does he say? Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. But how are they to do that? How are they to make disciples of all the nations? Well, we need a reverse of the Tower of Babel, Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men, where were they from? Every nation under heaven. And the curse of Babel is reversed, and at this sound the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And this global missionary work inaugurated at the Great Commission empowered at Pentecost will one day lead to its true fulfillment, Revelation chapter 5. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Again, I've hit some highlights along the way, and I promise there are many more, and I hope once you've seen it, you cannot unsee it. And I offer that as the rich tapestry into which our psalm today is one thread. Psalm 67 is one thread in this tapestry of God desiring to bless the nations. And we'll see a picture of a God who shows his grace and favor and who creates a people from all the nations of the world. And in doing so, those of us who have been drawn from the nations of the world into the people of God will respond with glad and joyful worship. Let's look, Psalm 67, beginning verses 1 to 3. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Did verse 1 sound familiar to you? To speak of the grace and blessing of God to his people, the psalmist utilizes the familiar words of what we refer to as the Aaronic blessing. This was a blessing that God gave to the first high priest Aaron and directed him to use it to express God's blessing to his people. Numbers chapter 6 says this, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the people of Israel. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel and I will bless them. God is gracious to his people. He blesses his people with all that they need in this life. That phrase, make his face to shine upon us, 
is a picture of the favor of God towards his people like that of a king in the ancient world. One of the commentators writes about this, an ancient Near East monarch revealed in his facial expression either his pleasure or displeasure with the part who sought an audience with him. Similarly, God, the great king, assures his own that he receives them and cares for them with joy. If you belong to God through faith in Jesus, when God looks at you, his face is shining toward you. He looks at you to receive you as your, his own and that he cares for you with joy. Now, if you're reading closely, you'll notice there's one major deviation from the original blessing. Instead of being in the language of the priest, you, it is in the language of the people, us. Again, look at verse 1. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us. Again, one of the commentators writes about this. The psalmist encourages God's people to personalize the priestly benediction on themselves. God has been and always will be gracious to us. Every day he blesses us and shows us his favor. And for those who belong to God through faith in Jesus, we do not live in the fear of judgment and condemnation, but we rather we live under the joyful favor of our King. But this blessing is not just for us. There is a larger purpose in God's grace to us. Look at verse 2. After this blessing, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. God's grace to his people results in the growth of his people. Now, when the Bible talks about knowing God, it's more than just knowing facts about God. We are not saved by Bible quizzes. There's relational knowledge here as we would know a loved one. It is that close knowledge of the person which is the result of true friendship and true relationship. And to know God's way is to know him, but it also emphasizes that when we know God, we live according to his way, his way of life. To know God in faith is to then live a life according to his way of life. We can connect this to when Jesus refers to himself as the way to the Father in John 14. And in fact, early Christians were sometimes referred to as the way, which is recorded in Acts chapter 9. We have a relationship with God through the way of Jesus Christ as we live a life according to his way. And in this context, that this way would not just be known among God's people Israel, but that it would be known on earth. That all of the nations of the earth would walk according to the way of God. We see another related aspect of what God desires to be known. Look again, verse 2. Your saving power among the nations. Remember in the Old Testament, salvation refers both to God's physical deliverance of his people, but also to their spiritual salvation. Through his blessing and care for his people, one of the results of that there. One of the results is that the outside world sees God's salvation. God desires for his salvation to be known among all nations. The grace and salvation he shows to his people, he desires to show that same saving power to the nations. You see, grace doesn't come to us and stop. God desires to grow his people from all the nations. And God will use the grace he has shown you to bring others to himself. And this leads in the psalm to the first of two refrains. Look at verse 3. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. This is worship given to God, but it is also worship that anticipates more worship. 
As one author writes, the praise of Israel lies in the expectation that the nations will also join in the praise of Israel. Notice, I mentioned this last week, when you see nations or peoples, plural, it refers to those outside nations. The gospel does not end with us. Worship does not end with us. We are not a reservoir of God's blessing. We are rather links in a chain of God's people. The gospel will continue to spread over this whole earth and the kingdom of God will continue to grow to include people of every nation and all of us will join together in the worship of the king. This leads to the next part of the psalm where God's kingship is at the center of his worship. Let's look at verses 4 and 5. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. We have another call to the nations to become followers and worshipers of God. For those of a certain age, this idea of let the nations be glad will always draw us back to a book by John Piper of the same phrase, let the nations be glad. That in mind, let me pause a little bit and talk about how this psalm fits within the idea of missions. In one sense, we can talk about living missional lives, living in such a way that we are always reaching out to those around us. We can also speak of another layer about what we might call domestic missions, ministry to reach the unreached parts of our own country. But especially in the context of this psalm, we need to talk about international missions. This is missions where people leave their home country and serve in another country. And as we think about this, I can't help but think about the strong history that this church has of financially supporting international missions. 20 to 25% of our budget year to year goes to missions. And in addition to being involved as a church in missions, I think each one of us should be involved in some way with missions as a family or as an individual. You know, little things like the fact that at the front of our church directory, we have a great page of pictures, names, and contact information of the missionaries we support, along with a list of organizations we support. And as you think about God's call to the nations, I would encourage each of you to be in contact with one of these missionaries or to regularly pray for them or to receive their newsletter or even to personally support them financially. Both as a church, but each one of us should in some way be partnering with missionaries overseas for the spread of the gospel to the nations. And I say this especially to the younger folks in our congregation. God may be calling you to go to leave your home country and to live in another place as a missionary when you get older. To be a messenger of Jesus Christ to the nations because God desires the nations to be a part of his people. But let me make another connection through Piper's book to our psalm today. Again, if the book is familiar to you, You most likely have heard this quote before, missions exist because worship does not. Missions is so important, not because it's important in and of itself. Rather, missions exist so that more people will become worshipers of God. We go out into the world or send others out into the world so that the nations will be glad and sing for joy, We go out into the world so that all the peoples will praise you. But coming back to the text, I want to look at the specific reason these verses give that the peoples should worship God. Look at verse 4. 
For, right, because you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. First, you judge the people with equity. There is no favoritism with the Lord. He is the perfectly just judge. His judgments are always upright and good. That word equity here has a neat embedded word picture. That word can also be used or translated level ground. So Psalm 26 says, My foot stands on level ground. In the great assembly I will bless the Lord. There's no bias or disadvantage to the poor and weak in the justice of God. His justice is pure and true, and everyone stands on the same level. As we might say in our culture, there are no tears of justice within the Lord. God treats all people with perfect and righteous justice. But he also guides the nations upon earth. That word translated guide is the same word used and translated lead to refer to God leading the people of Israel out of Egypt and through the wilderness, places like Exodus chapter 13. Picture the people of the earth like the people of Israel following God through the terrain of the wilderness to the promised land. God rules this world in such a way that he leads and guides the nations. And wherever God leads is for the good of the people he is leading. And to you, I might say, where is God taking you? Where is he leading you? You can live your life of following his lead, knowing that he is leading you to a good place. And because this is who God is, we return to that chorus we saw in verse 3. Verse 5, let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. We call out to the nations to praise the God who is the just king who leads his people through life to the good places. This leads us to the last part of the psalm, verses 6 and 7, where we see another call to worship and believe because of God's goodness. Look at verse 6, 7 with me. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. We see multiple references to God blessing his people. Right? End of verse 6. God our God shall bless us. Verse 7. God shall bless us. Right in a row. But in these verses, the picture of God's blessing is seen at the first part of verse 6. The earth has yielded its increase. We've seen this in the, the Psalms we've been in in the last couple of weeks of the God providing abundantly for the needs of his people. And this idea of of using the earth has yielded its increase. Remember that in the Old Testament, and honestly for most of human history, nations and communities were predominantly agrarian. Whenever you read your Bible, remember, no Costco, no Safeway, not even a Payless. And one of the ways to picture God's blessing was through the picture of crops and livestock. And the psalmist knows that God shall bless us, that God is the God who abundantly provides for his people. The psalmist can trust the provision of God, but again, the blessing does not end with his people. This leads to the last phrase of the psalm, let all all the ends of the earth fear him. Again, this talk of blessing comes again and again to the nations. And we need to talk about a few bits in there. First, that idea of fear. Fear here is properly understood as the fear of the Lord. As you look at how that language is used in the Bible, it is a language of worship. Fearing the Lord is recognizing that he is the almighty God of the universe and you are not. It is an awe-inspiring fear. It is a fear of respect and honor and humility. And it is one of these buckets 
into which the Bible talks about people being sincere believers in God. But again, the blessing of God's people leads to the growth of God's people. That in the abundant provision of God, through that blessing, there will be more people who fear the Lord from all the nations of the earth, here described as the ends of the earth. Now, I know you've heard this from before, but I, bear, but I think it bears repeating to help us step into the world of the Bible. Remember the historical context of your Bible. And in ancient Israel, North America is definitely the ends of the earth. So the people in this room are a partial fulfillment of this psalm. Sometimes I think it's healthy for us not to see ourselves as the center of the Bible. <laughs> because it's by God's grace that the ends of the earth are included, and it's a reminder that it is only by God's grace that we are included. <laughs> because we are, at the time this was written, we are the ends of the earth. But understanding that's who we are to the original audience helps us to understand our part to reach the ends of the earth today. Other countries today we might call the ends of the earth. And just as by God's grace our end of the earth was reached, we are to be a part of reaching today's ends of the earth. The blessing of God does not stop in this room. It does not stop in this country we are not a reservoir collecting God's blessings. We are one link in a gospel chain that includes all believers from all times, from all the nations. And one day this chain will culminate, as we read in Revelation 5, in this choir singing the praises of God from every tribe and tongue and nation. Using the language and form of the ironic blessing that we saw in verse 1, we see a God who is worthy of praise because he blesses his people and shows them grace. And we see a God who wants to extend that blessing and grace and his ways to be known among the nations. We see a call to the nations to find joy and gladness in the righteous rule of God. He is the righteous God who rules with justice and perfectly leads and guides his people through the wanderings of this life. We worship God as the God who abundantly provides for and blesses his people. And this God calls out, to all the nations to fear and honor him as the true God of the universe. And God is calling us into that work. We are to be his witnesses in this world, in our community, and to the ends of the earth. Propelled by worship to reach others that they may come to Christ in repentance and faith and themselves become worshipers of the living God. Let me close with an extended quote from, from Piper's book on missions, Let the Nations Be Glad. Worship, therefore, is the fuel and goal of missions. It's the goal of missions because in missions we simply aim to bring the nations into the white hot enjoyment of God's glory. The goal of missions is the gladness of the peoples and the greatness of God. But worship is also the fuel of missions. Passion for God and worship precedes the author of, offer of God in preaching. You can't commend what you don't cherish. Missionaries will never call out, let the nations be glad, if they cannot say from the heart, I rejoice in the Lord. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praises to your name, O Most High. 
missions begins and ends in worship. We worship a God and rejoice in him, our Savior, our King, our Provider. We rejoice in his blessing as we join his work in calling the nations to himself to grow the worship of the Lord across the earth. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the gift of your word where you have revealed your word to us through the scriptures. That we would sing your praises, that we would worship you as the gracious and loving God who rules and provides for his people. But that we would also see our role in reaching the nations. That the gospel doesn't end with us. That we are not reservoirs of God's blessing, but rather a link in the chain of gospel blessing. God, use this church, use our supported missionaries, and use each of us to bring the ends of the earth to become worshipers of you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching this video from Hillside Evangelical Free Church. Our hope is that these resources will help you grow as a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. We're located in Green Bank, Washington on Whidbey Island. And if you live in the area and are looking for a church home, we'd love to have you join us. You can find out more information at our website at hillside-efc.com.